Hello fantastic people, today I would like to show you how to create this simple yet effective AI for your 3D game. Even though this tutorial is horror branded, those techniques will definitely work also for other types of 3D games. First a little bit of setup. I drag my model into the scene and then I set up the animations using the animator. I'm going to have three states, idle, walking and biting. I make transitions between most of them. The transitions between idle and walk will be controlled by a property called is walking. Biting will be triggered by a, well, trigger called bite. Now for the enemy bite state, it's very important to have the has exit time enabled. We want to wait until the animation is finished before we transition to other states. Also, you probably noticed I'm not setting up transition from bite to walk. That's because my idle transition duration is very short and in case I need to transition directly to walking, it won't be even noticeable. Then I put the animator on the side and test the basic transitions. Fantastic! Now I open the navigation panel and dock it on the side. I enable gizmos by clicking this little button and then I add nav mesh surface. If you have never worked with nav mesh, it's a very popular solution to provide a pathfinding for your characters. It works pretty well and it's very easy to use. The blue areas that appeared on the floor are the areas that are walkable. As you see, we have a little problem. It looks like there is no enough space for the character to go through the doors. Let's fix that. In the navigation panel, we need to change some properties of the humanoid agent type. Depending on the NPC, you can have different types of the agent types. Basically, you may want to have some enemies that can fly or you can have some enemies that are very large and shouldn't be walking through certain areas. Names of the different settings are pretty self-explanatory. To make our character a little bit narrower, we simply decrease the radius. And just to be on the safe side, we also going to adjust height. Because our floor is completely flat, I am also going to change the slope from 45 degrees to zero. Now on the Nafmer surface object, I'm going to click the bake button. That will simply recalculate the nav mesh. Now, it's almost perfect. We see we have this little area which is still inaccessible. That's because we have the doors in the way. I'm going to deactivate them and recalculate the nav mesh. If you have moving objects in the scene, you can make them dynamic obstacles, which will carve out parts of the nav mesh when they are present somewhere. To do that, you can simply add a component nav mesh obstacle. If you want them to cut out piece of the nav mesh, you can simply check the carve checkbox. Now our enemy also needs a component. This time it's called nav mesh agent. I am going to adjust the radius and height as well here. Now let's add first behavior, patrolling. First I create multiple empty game objects and place them along the patrol route. Because we are going to make the character stop at each point for a couple of seconds, I'm not going to add many points. Now it's time to create our enemy script. I'm going to call it enemy controller. After it compiles, I am adding it to the enemy object. First I add an array that will store the patrol points. Then I add another serialized property, this time for patrol wait time. This will be the amount of time the enemy stands still when reaching the patrol point. Then some private fields, one to store the nav mesh agent, one to store the animator, then the index of the current patrol point and a boolean to know if the character is currently waiting or not. First, let's create a method that will allow us to go to the next patrol point. 
First, if we have no patrol route set, we'll simply return and do nothing. Otherwise, we send the character to the next point's position. We do that using the setDestination method on the agent class. Then we use this special formula to increase the current patrol index by 1, or if there are no more points, we simply change it back to 0. Then we need a method to wait at the patrol point. I'll fix the name in a moment. First, we need to ensure that our flag is waiting is set to true and that our agent is stopped. Then we simply wait for the amount of time we set in the serialized property. After that time, we allow the agent to move again, send it to the next point, and finally set the is waiting flag to false. Now it's time to create a patrol method. If it is called when we are waiting, we simply do nothing and return. Otherwise, if the path is not being recalculated and we are closer to the patrol point than a certain distance, let's create a serialized property for that. We simply start our coroutine, wait at the patrol point. If you need a little bit of refresher on coroutines, here's the tutorial for that. Then, of course, we need a small method to update the animations of the enemy. We simply check if the length of the velocity vector on the agent is larger than some extremely small value. And then we use it to set the property on the animator. Now, of course, we need to call our methods in the update method. On start, we have to send our enemy to the first patrol point. And of course, we need to fill our references. We could do that in the start method, but if the components are on the object itself, I usually prefer to do it in the awake method. Now, in the inspector on our enemy script, we have to make sure to set the patrol road points. Let's test it out. Fantastic! Our character is walking and stopping as expected. The algorithm gods seem to be very angry with me recently, so if you could subscribe to my channel and like this video, and maybe even leave a comment, that could make them a little bit happier and help them spread my tutorials to more people. Now let's make the enemy follow the player. We start by creating a simple enum for enemy states. At this point we'll have only patrolling and following states. Then in the references we add another serialized field, this time for a player's transform. Then we need some extra settings. First one for the detection range. Then for the view angle. Basically we'll want to know how wide the vision of the enemy is. And then finally the time after which the enemy will go to patrolling when he doesn't see the player. Then we need to know in which state the enemy is, so we create a private field for that. We defaulted to patrolling. Of course, I just realized I misnamed the enum. Let's fix that. Then we also need a timer to store the information about how long the enemy doesn't see the player. In the update method, we calculate the distance to player. Then I'm adding a switch statement First for the patrolling case. Normally we patrol. However, if the distance to player is smaller than the detection range and the enemy can see player, we switch the state to the following. We have to remember to add the break statement at the end. Now let's write the can see player method. It will consist of two checks. The first one is is facing player. This method will check if the enemy is rotated towards the player. And then has clear path to player will check if there are no obstacles in between. Let's create the is facing player method. First, we calculate the direction to player. Then, using the vector free angle, we check what is the angle in between the direction to player and the actual enemy direction. Then, we return true if that angle is half of our revision angle. Otherwise, it will return false. Now time for the has clear path to player method. First, we grab unnormalized direction to player. Unnormalized, that means it also contains the information about the distance. Then we perform a right cast. We start at the enemy's position 
we shoot the ray in the direction of player, this time normalized because we are interested only in the direction, not in the length of the vector. Then we get out the rightcast hit as hit variable and ultimately for the max distance, we use the distance between the enemy and the player. If we hit something and it's player, it means the path is clear. If we hit something else, then the path is not clear. Otherwise, it means we didn't hit anything. That means the path is also clear. Now we go back to our update method. We need a case for the following state. What should happen then? Well, the enemy should follow the player. Let's create that method now. Inside of it, we simply set the destination to the player's position. If the enemy cannot see the player, we increase our player lost timer. Then when the enemy waits for a long enough time, he should go back to patrolling. So we change his state and send him to the next patrol point. Actually, let's do something slightly different. Because the enemy can finish in different places, instead of sending him to the next point, let's select for him the closest point. In the go to closest patrol point method, we simply loop through all of the points, we check their distance to the enemy, and we always keep the index of the closest one. Then when the loop is done, we set the index of the next point and we send our agent to it. Back in the update method, if the enemy spots the player while following him, we reset the player lost timer. And of course, we cannot forget the break statement. Let's test it out. When we walk behind the enemy, everything works as expected. When he sees us, he starts to follow us. And finally, when he loses us for long enough time, he goes back to patrolling. Fantastic. Now it's biting time. I mean, you know, the enemy attack time. So first let's add the attacking state to our enemy state enum. Then let's add serialized field for the attack range. Then one private field of type boolean is biting. Honestly, is attacking probably would be better and more consistent name. Now when the enemy is following player, we check if the distance from him to player is shorter than the attack range. If so, we change the state to attacking and call start attack method. In the start attack method, first of all, we ensure that the agent is stopped. Then we set our is biting flag to true. And then of course, we notify the animator it should be playing the right animation. Then let's create another case in our update method, this time for the attacking state. First, we need to ensure we are attacking, so we call the attack method. Then if we are not attacking, and the distance to player is larger than the attack range, we go back to following. We of course need to make sure that the agent is not stopped. And let's not forget the break statement. Now when it comes to the attack method, we first ensure that the agent is stopped. Then we calculate the rotation towards the player, while ignoring any variations in their height. And then if the direction is not vector 0, we make the enemy look towards the player. Now we need one small method for the animation end. Let's call it on byte animation end. It will simply set the is biting to false. Then on my byte animation, at the very end, I invoke the method using the animation event. When you put the animation event on the last frame, sometimes weird things may happen. So I move my animation event a little bit earlier. The enemy follows us as expected, bites us, and goes back to patrolling when needed. Fantastic! Now let's see it in context of what we created until now. Environment with nice lighting, some props, and of course with character controller and interactable doors. If you found this tutorial useful, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like this video. And of course, if you are looking for a nice positive game dev community, feel free to visit our Discord. Have a fantastic day, love you and bye bye.